Hey, good morning. good morning. I'm going to invite Mrs. Star Aukerman to the pulpit to lead us and open our service in prayer. Mrs. Aukerman. I'm starting to believe I need a stool up here so that I look bigger. Let's, uh, I know you're all sleep deprived, <laughs> so let's be able to focus on the Lord. We came into his house to worship him. So clear your hearts, clear your minds, and let us pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, we just come before you now, and we're joyful that we can come to worship you. We thank you, God, that we are able to do this when there are so many people that aren't. We ask, Lord, that you send your Holy Spirit to fill this building and fill our souls so that we can hear the messages and the sermons that are going to be preached. Open them up to us, Lord. Let the scriptures come alive. Just be with us and be with Pastor Dave. Fill him with the Holy Spirit so that he can give us your words. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. I appreciate that more than I can say. The first song is number 455, I Am Thine, O Lord. Page number 455. I am thine, O Lord, I have heard thy voice, and it told thy love to me. But I long to rise in the arms of faith, and be closer drawn to thee. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope, and my will be lost in thine. Draw me nearer, Nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding sign. Oh, the pure delight of a single hour that before thy throne I spend. When I kneel in prayer and with thee, my God, I commune as friend with friend. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. There are depths of love that I cannot know Till I cross the narrow sea There are heights of joy that I may not reach Till I rest in peace with thee Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord To the cross where thou hast died Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. And amen. That was beautiful. Our unison rate reading today comes from Leviticus chapter 10, verses 16 through 18. I'm going to invite Mrs. Melanie Mancuso to the pulpit to lead us in this reading. Please stand if you're able and comfortable to do so. And however you pronounce these names that's how I'll pronounce these names okay it's a deal and Moses diligently sought the goat of the sin offering and behold it was burnt and he was angry with Eleazar and Ithamar the sons of Aaron which were left alive saying 
Wherefore have ye not eaten the sin offering in the holy place, seeing it is most holy, and God hath given it you to bear the iniquity of the congregation, to make atonement for them before the Lord? Behold, the blood of it was not brought in within the holy place. Ye should indeed have eaten it in the holy place, as I commanded. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word, and you may be seated. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> when we left off last week, the Israelites are making very little progress getting themselves to the promised land of milk and honey. In fact, they are still camped at the base of Mount Sinai, where God had given Moses, among other things, the Ten Commandments. It has been over a year, a year since they left Egypt. And because they have been detained uh, due to their disobedience and grumblings, God instructs Moses to have his people build a portable tabernacle in the wilderness where the Lord can dwell and be worshipped there. Personally, I don't believe this was God's original plan. I would think that God would rather have had the people build a permanent temple in the promised land, but the people getting to the promised land of Canaan is taking much longer than first anticipated. As we learned last week, two Levite priests named Nad, Nadab and Abihu are burned to death by God because they mistakenly offer strange fire before the Lord. What does this mean? Well, no one knows for certain, but whatever this exactly means, we, we can conclude that doing so was not part of their instructions, and this strange fire really offended God. These two fellows, Nadab and Abihu, were the priests Aaron's uh, high priest Aaron's sons, and upon their deaths, Moses, uh, Aaron's brother, reminds Aaron that it doesn't matter who disrespects the Lord, whether they be priests or not, God will not be mocked, God will be revered, and with this, Aaron does not raise his objections to the Lord's deadly action. Moses then summons his two cousins, Mishael and Elzaphan, who are also from the tribe of Levi. Moses, is, Moses instructs his two cousins to go collect the remains of Nadab and Abihu from the sanctuary and take what's left of their body to the outskirts of the camp where they, the, their bodies can be disposed of. And Mishael and Elzaphan obey. Now, we assume that there's not much left of these two men. The Bible tells us that Mishael and Elzaphan carry, uh, collect and carry Nadab and Abihu out of the camp in their coats. So apparently there's just ash left, maybe some bone, I don't know. Carrying their ashes in their coats also shields their remains from the eyes of onlookers who might take pity on Nadab and Abihu. No pity should be shown these two brothers who offended God by offering him strange fire. Moses, after this is done, Moses then has a meeting with his brother Aaron and Aaron's two remaining sons, Eleazar and Ithamar. He warns them not to mourn Nadab and Abihu's deaths in the traditional Hebrew way. They are not to uncover their heads or rip their clothing or put ashes on their faces or anything like that. Even though they are close loved ones, mourning two such priests who offended God so greatly might also be an offense to God. God has already shown his anger mourning these two uh, uh, God has already shown his anger and mourning these two might incur even more of God's wrath. And that's something the Israelites cannot afford to do. Two Levi priests have already been lost. There's no need to risk any lives of other people. Moses instructs Aaron and his two remaining sons not to leave the tabernacle. They are priests first and family second. They have been anointed. Their duties as priests are more important than any sadness due to the loss of these, their family members. They are to wait in the tabernacle for God to lead them as to what to do next, and the men obey. And if there's any lesson in this story to us today, I suppose it's that sometimes we have to swallow our feelings, put our emotions to the side, and do the duties expected of us. You know, sometimes we have to put on our big boy pants, or we have to, the show must go on, and all those trite things we always say. I mean, that's life, and sometimes life is rough. Moving on. The Lord then speaks to Aaron, the high priest. And the Lord tells Aaron that he is neither to, neither he nor his sons are to drink any alcohol. Doing so might hinder their discernment between what is clean and what is unclean. And drinking may also cloud their judgment when teaching the children of Israel the statutes of God. Moses then instructs these men to take the goat, 
that we assume Nadab and Abihu were about to sacrifice at their times of death, and they are to roast this goat upon the altar. The goat offering to the Lord was meant to atone for the sins of the people. Seemingly, Nadab and Abihu didn't get a chance to make this sacrifice before they were killed with fire. The meat sacrifice is considered holy, so throwing any out so throwing out any leftovers in the trash would be seen, seen as disregarding that which is sacred. So Moses instructs these three fellows to instead eat the roasted goat meat at the altar in the tabernacle. Moses instructs them to share the meat with their families, but their families have to eat their, their share away from the tabernacle in a clean place. And they are to all eat, they are to eat all this meat until there is nothing left over. Also, this meat is to be eaten without leavened bread. Why? Well, leaven is yeast. It makes the dough rise. And because of this attribute, leaven is symbolic of sin. One little sin can swell up into several greater sins, just like a little leaven can swell up a whole lump of bread dough. By the way, this is why there is no yeast in our communion bread to this day. Our communion bread symbolizes the body of Christ, and there is no sin in the body of Christ. Anyway, later on, Moses goes to check on Aaron and his two sons to make sure they, that all has been done as he has previously instructed. And Moses sees the goat. It's been roasted, but it's not been eaten, and he becomes very angry. Moses becomes angry when he discovers the goat was burnt, but not eaten. He demands answers from his brother Aaron as to why he was disobeyed. And Aaron replies, that Moses, calm down. The sacrifice for the iniquity of the people has been made, and the sacrifice pleases the Lord, and that's all that matters. However, Moses, you don't know everything. The Lord would not be pleased with me eating the meat or anything else, for that matter, while I am mourning the deaths of my sons. So Moses, you'll just have to get over it. Moses, this will have to do. And Moses understands and agrees with Aaron's decision. And God understands and agrees with Aaron's decision. And that, ladies and gentlemen, concludes our one and only story from the entire book of Leviticus. There you go. I told you the lesson would be short today.
Our responsive reading today comes from Luke chapter 22, verses 42 to 46. I'm going to invite Mrs. Uh, Miss uh, Christy Yannick to the pulpit to lead us in this reading. Let's all stand if we're able and comfortable to stand. Luke chapter 22, verses 42 to 46. Saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven. Strengthening him, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose up from prayer, and was come to his disciples, he found him sleeping for sorrow, and said unto them, Why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. Amen. You may be seated. Two thousand years ago, our Lord and Savior is hanging from that old rugged cross. After breathing his last breath, a guard standing at the foot of the cross takes a spear and stabs Jesus in his side. The Bible describes the liquid that flows from that wound as blood mixed with water. This is a distasteful act indeed, but this is not the first time Jesus has bled. The, this guard is not the first to draw the blood of Jesus Christ. Sometime earlier, soldiers take spikes and nail Jesus' hands and feet to the cross that he's laying upon before it's jerked into the hole in the ground. The blood of Christ spurts out of these freshly made wounds. This blood continually flows from his hands and his feet until he takes his final breath. This is a heartless act to be sure, but this is not the first time Jesus bleeds. These soldiers are not the first to draw blood from our Savior. Earlier that day, men whip the Lord's back, ripping his skin. When they are done, his back is covered with raw, red, bloody stripes. Blood flows from these wounds until with the time he gives up the ghost. As dreadful as this act is, this is not the first time Jesus' blood flows. These men are not the first to draw blood from our Lord. Sometime earlier, as the soldiers mock him, they force a crown made of great thorns into his head. The blood streams down from his skull all the way to the ground beneath. To literally add insult to injury, they pluck out his beard, leaving his face raw and bloody. As painful and as demeaning as this action is, these soldiers are not the first to draw Christ's blood. Because even earlier still than all the events I just mentioned, there is an episode in which Jesus bleeds from the very, he bleeds his very first drops of blood. Before all this happens, before the brutality, before his mock trials, before even his arrest, Jesus bleeds. So who is the perpetrator of this bleeding? Was it the soldiers? No. Was it his enemies? No. Then who? Who is the first to draw our Savior's blood? Ladies and gentlemen, the first to draw Jesus' blood is Jesus Christ himself. The Son of God causes himself to bleed before anyone else has a chance or even an opportunity to do so. Hours before his aggressors can take pleasure in making our Lord and Savior bleed, Jesus himself causes his own blood to spill. And I refer you to the response of reading where we hear, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling to the ground. No, brothers and sisters, his enemies did not draw first blood, it was Jesus Christ himself. So what's going on here? Let me just set the stage the best I can. Jesus and his disciples have just finished what is commonly called the Last Supper. At this time, Judas leaves the rest and is busy making the final preparations to have Jesus arrested. Eight of his other disciples are elsewhere. We're not told where. And Jesus, along with Peter, James, and John, have snuck into a nearby garden in a place called Gethsemane to pray. Jesus tells Peter, James, and John to keep watch and pray while he goes off a little further away from them so he can pray by himself. Now, first of all, why? 
Why could he tell the men to pray by themselves and he was going to pray by himself? And I have no answer to that other than the prayers are different. Jesus knows what's about to happen. So he's praying a whole different prayer than the three men are just to pray generally for, for things and for blessings and outcomes and safety and all that sort of thing. So I think that's why the prayers are separated. But while Jesus is busy praying for God's will, the three disciples fall asleep. As, as appears all of you <laughs> would like to do right now. Yeah, losing that hour is no picnic. I need my beauty sleep. Desperately. Anyway, checking on them, Jesus rebukes them for not being steadfast. He then resumes his prayer just to later find the three men have fallen asleep again. And Jesus rebukes them again. This goes on for three times and on the heels of the third time, after Jesus' prayer time is over, Judas escorts guards and soldiers to Jesus. He kisses him and they arrest Jesus, but I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll pick that up next week. But we're not done. <laughs> we'll talk about Judas next week. Before he is arrested, while Peter, James, and John keep falling asleep, a short time before his aggressors would take pleasure in wounding him, we find our Lord praying in torment and in anguish. Dare I say there has never been a more agonizing prayer prayed before this moment, nor has there ever been a more agonizing prayer since. His prayer is so torturous, he is so filled with distress, that he is causing himself to sweat great drops of blood, Jesus Christ is the first to draw blood. As he prays in agony, hours before his crucifixion, Jesus calls what is a, he's about to endure a cup, C-U-P, cup, from which he asks his father to be excused. I don't think this is a random choice of words, and I don't think it's a coincidence that in the very same chapter, Luke 22, Jesus refers to the word cup in the communion service of the Last Supper. And now he refers to the brutality that is to befall him as a cup. Just a short time before his agonizing prayer in the garden, Jesus passes a literal cup in the upper room to his disciples at that first communion service. And Jesus tells them, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Let's think about that again, ladies and gentlemen. In the upper room, Jesus prays and passes a literal cup containing figurative blood. And now we see him in the garden, praying that a figurative cup be passed from him before he sheds literal blood. The Bible is nothing if not poetic. If you look for it, it's there. Those, those moments of irony. Dare we wonder what Jesus means when he asks God the Father to remove this cup from him? I mean, we hate to think that Jesus, of all people, has a weak moment. And is asking God the Father to reconsider this whole dying for the sins of the world deal. We hate to think that after spending years of knowing what is to come, Jesus is now having second thoughts. You know, Jesus has lived with a clock over his head. A time. He knew five years before this, ten years before this, maybe even as a child, he knew that this day was upon him. This day was coming and this day is on him now. This day and what is to come is not taking Jesus by surprise. He knows how things have to end. It is hard to imagine that Jesus at the very last moment is momentarily rethinking his whole purpose in coming to this earth. But ladies and gentlemen, I can see no other interpretation. I believe Jesus who is moments away from being betrayed, denied, tortured and crucified is indeed asking God perhaps only for our own edification, but he's still asking God nonetheless for another option. Father, is there any other way, any other way we can bring salvation to the believers other than through my brutal death? If there is, could we please take that other way instead? I'll be honest with you as I always try to be from the pulpit. Out of the pulpit, I'm not so honest, <laughs> but in the pulpit. Jesus' prayer in the garden has always bothered me. It's bothered me for years. No matter how I look at it, it troubles me. Jesus Christ is both God and man. We know this. Jesus Christ is 100% God because he is the Son of God and a member of the Trinity. Jesus Christ is also 100% man before he was, because he was born of a woman to be an unblemished sacrifice for the rest of mankind. I know that mathematically that doesn't make sense. 100% and 100% equals 100%. But that's, that's the miracle of Jesus. Jesus, is, Jesus Christ is all God and he's all man. 
If I think of Jesus as being God, as he prays in the garden, I am bothered. Jesus, who is the Son of God, is asking God the Father to change his mind, which he does not, of course. The Father has a plan for which the Son seemingly wants to be released. One could make the case that the Son and the Father are not quite on the same page. They're not quite in unity, which I simply cannot accept. And yet, if I think of Jesus being solely a man at the prayer of Gethsemane, I am equally troubled. Jesus, who is a man, gets angry at his disciples, who are also just mere men, for falling asleep. Jesus, the man, is showing weakness by trying to bypass the crucifixion, yet he chastises the men for showing weakness and falling asleep. One could make the case that Jesus Christ is a hypocrite, which I simply cannot accept. I have a hard time wrapping my head around this whole scene, but, it, but as with much of Christianity, I'm resolved to accept it and believe it, even though I don't quite fully understand it. But however we look at it, Jesus apparently asked the Father for permission to sidestep the cross. And the Father answers his son's prayer. The Father says, no, you can't. And this struggle between father and son is seemingly so great that it causes the son to sweat blood. Later on, we know that Jesus will be forsaken by the father. As Jesus takes upon his sacrifice, the sins of the world, the sins of you and I, he will cry out from the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So what is really this, what, what is really this cup with, from which Jesus asks the father to be excused? Is it the brutal beating he is about to endure? Is it the sins of the world that are about to be laid upon his sacrifice? Or is it the fact that he will be forsaken by his father, a feeling he has never felt before? And perhaps it's all of the above. I hold to the literal interpretation of these verses because of what happens next. After Jesus asks the father to remove this cup, if it be his will, the father apparently answers no, after this all happens, something marvelous is next. It, we read in Luke twenty two forty three, And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. After Jesus pleads for his father to have another will, another way, after Jesus pleads if he could possibly be excused from what is to come, notice the father does not rebuke his son for his weakness. In fact, the father does not get angry at all. The father has compassion upon the son's torment. He sends an angel to minister to his son to strengthen him. Brothers and sisters, where else have we seen in the Bible angels ministering to the Lord? Three years prior, at the beginning of his ministry, Jesus is in the wilderness. After enduring and resisting three temptations of the devil, Jesus is just wiped out. What does God do to help his son? God the Father sends angels to strengthen Jesus. In both the wilderness before and in the garden now, angels are present. However, we don't see these guardian angels protecting Jesus from physical harm. We don't see them protecting him from the crucifixion, but we do see the angels strengthening Jesus during his times of trial and temptation. Luke 5.13 tells us that after the devil unsuccessfully tempts Jesus three times, the devil departs from Jesus for a season. That means the devil will return. Well, perhaps, maybe, the season is over and the devil is back, this time in the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, I don't know that. That's just conjecture. The Bible doesn't tell us that, but something more is going on here. One could conclude by this that whenever Jesus is tempted, God does not forsake him. God sends angels. Jesus needs the angels to strengthen him so he can minister to the Lord and minister to us, and God obliges. At the garden, Jesus is weakened when he asks the Father to remove the cup, but instead the Father removes his weakness by sending an angel to strengthen him. It's actually a very touching and beautiful scene. Let's get back to our story. In his purpose as our Savior... Jesus seemingly has a moment of re reconsideration. But before we call Jesus weak, we must ask ourselves, would we have the strength to endure what he's about to endure? And the answer is no. Not one of you, not one of us, has the strength to endure what Jesus is about to go through. It turns out he wasn't so weak after all, was he, when we compare him to ourselves. And he knows every 
nail that's going to be nailed in him. He knows forehand every whip, every slice of the whip that's going to hit his back. You know, we have the benefit of being ignorant of what is going to happen next. Jesus did not have that benefit. The blood he sheds as he in anguish prays for another option isn't shed in weakness, it is shed in strength, and it is shed for us. But perhaps the biggest lesson in the story is this. If Jesus could not find a way to bypass the cross, what chance do we have in bypassing the cross? If Jesus Christ, the Son of God, could not sidestep the cross, then we obviously cannot either. There's no salvation except through the cross. Jesus is right when he says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh to the Father but by him. Through the cross is the only way. It was the only way for Jesus, and it's the only way for us. I hope that during our monthly communion observances, we all envision the bleeding of our Lord on the cross caused by his aggressors before drinking our cups. But I dare say most of us don't think of the bleeding which Jesus causes himself. The bleeding from that agonizing prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. Have we ever considered the great anguish which resulted in our Savior bleeding from the inside out? We are commanded to remember the blood of Christ, and we are to do so every communion service. But if I may be so bold, which bleeding are we to remember? The bleeding caused by others or the bleeding he causes himself? I suppose in a way Jesus causes all of his own bleedings. At any moment he could have stopped all the torture. He had the power to prevent the whipping and the nailing and the stabbing. Like the song says, he could have called 10,000 angels. Why, he could have called 10,000 angels with fire in their eyes and swords in their hands that he could have swarmed down upon Golgotha until nothing was left but a bloody swamp. But revenge was not his agenda. Payback was not on his to-do list. What was on his mind? Others. Us, you and I. We who have trusted and those who will still are to trust in the only way to receive salvation. Jesus' death on the cross. Ladies and gentlemen, I like to think that even though Jesus willingly allows others to wound him, all the bleeding he does was of his own accord. All the bleeding was by his own choice. I say this because at the end of the prayer, after the angel strengthens him, Jesus does not run. He does not argue. He does not fight back. He doesn't even flinch. He willingly takes his place as our Savior. Before I close, I would be remiss if I didn't mention those three sleepy heads, James, Peter, and John. Why did Peter, James, and John fall asleep? Well, they had a long day. It was a big day. They had the Passover meal. They had the foot washing. They had a lot going on. The obvious answer is they were sleepy. The not so obvious answer is they simply didn't get it. If they had, I think they would have stayed awake. They didn't realize what was upon them. And there is, like I said, a blessing in not knowing what's going to happen next. You know, Jesus had been telling them for quite some time that this day was upon them, that this day was coming. Jesus had told them that he would soon be delivered into the hands of his aggressors. But these three didn't get it. As close as they were to him, they simply ignored all the signs and all the verbal warnings. We followers of Christ here today, we believers have to do better than that. We live in uncertain times to be sure. We don't know what's happening next. And like Jesus in the garden, knowing the end was nigh, I've had so many Christians share with me that they also feel that the end is near. Do anyone feel that? We can't afford to doze off now. We can't afford to ignore the signs that there may be choppy waters ahead. I'm not a doom and gloom kind of, doom and gloom kind of guy. It might be a thousand years before we hit the end times, but I don't know. I just don't know. This is not the time for us to fall asleep. We cannot fall asleep while, when our Lord's will is waiting for us to obey it. For us Christians, our time is better well spent watching and praying, just as the Lord commanded his disciples to do. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you for this very perplexing and head-scratching moment in this life of your son where he's praying to the point where he's in so much anguish, Lord, about what is about to happen. We, we don't quite get it, but one day we will. When we're in heaven, this will all be made clear to us, and we're so grateful for that. For the time being, we'll just know that what Jesus did was not easy. What he did was painful. 
He felt every blow. He felt every spike. He felt every insult. And Lord, we know this because he died for us and he had to feel these things. And these things were so agonizing to him that he prayed to be released from him. But thank goodness he wasn't and he died for our sins so we could have a way into heaven. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. The song is number 432. Just as I am without one plea, please stand. For the sake of time, we'll just sing the first verse of number 432, softly and tenderly. Oh, I got the wrong song. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. Softly and tenderly Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. Patient and loving, he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come home. Ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling a sinner. Yeah, you know the rest of it. <laughs> Brother Mike, please close our service with prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the opportunity to come into your house, Lord, and to hear your word. We just ask that you open our hearts and our minds, that we can digest it and apply it to our lives and everything we do. Lord, we just ask a special blessing upon everyone on our prayer list, whether spoken aloud or held in our hearts. Let your presence be felt with them and all, that there's, all the people caring for them. Just help them and let them know that you're with them. Lord, we just ask to be with each and every one of us as we leave your house. Help us to do your will and keep us safe. We pray all this through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Thank you for coming. You're dismissed. Have a great day.